Good evening. Thanks for coming out. I think it started it's right about 6 30, so a little bit respectful of your time. We hopefully get a huge out of here before 11 or 11 15 tonight. Um, again, thank you for coming. Quick, let me do a couple of quick introductions. Jason, Mr. Beaver was planning on being here tonight, and uh, last minute he texted me and said he had a bell out, so uh, everything's fine, but he wanted me to send his good wishes along and, uh, and uh, tell you that he said hello, but he, he's not going to be here tonight. Just quick introductions. My name is John Serafine. I'm the Director of Counseling here at McQuaid and one of the college counselors. Jeff Griffa is my colleague and uh, one of the other college counselors. And then Emory Glado, who's sitting over there, runs our College Advisement Center. So, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but we told, we told the kids the other day that between the three of us, we have like 85 years of uh, college counseling experience. I, I guess that's a good thing. Um, I always tell people it's kind of like a, a farmer's insurance commercial. You know, we, we, we know a thing or two because we, we've seen a thing or two. But uh, we've done this for a long time, and I think we've, uh, we have different viewpoints. I think we work pretty well together as a group. Um, just so you know how, how the senior year is set up in terms of the college counselors, like I said, we divide the alphabet in half. I have the, the first half of the alphabet, Alamante through Keller, and Jeff has the second half, Kelly through Zeusik. Right, so that's how we are aligned, and that's how we uh, will we'll work through the rest of the year with uh, everything related to college. Um, let, let me start by talking a little bit about you know, where we've been, what we've done, and, you know, and where we're headed. So Jeff and I picked up with the um, with the juniors in the midpoint of last year, with the senior class in the midpoint of their junior year. So we did the course selections with them for their senior year, and you know during that meeting we had conversations about college and standardized testing and, and all the things that kind of go along with it. Then in the spring we did a series of what we call our college planning seminars. So everyone attended five classes with us uh, after school during flex. Uh, on a variety of topics, the college search, you know, financial aid, testing, um, just a wide overview of, uh, of, of the college search process. Then in the spring, we follow those up with some one-on-one -on -one meetings with the kids that were more specific about their area, where, where are they specifically in the search. Then in the summer, in uh, mid, mid to late August, we did a series of college or summer seminars. Jeff did one on uh, the introduction to the common application and syncing the kids not be honest with their common app account. Uh, I did one of the college essay, and some last minute prep for SAT and ACT. And then earlier this week, Monday and Tuesday, the seniors sit right here, sat right here, and we did kind of, okay, it's time to get to work now. Uh, and, and just kind of get to some nuts and bolts about how do we handle the college application process here at McQuaid. Give them a timeline, you know, give them a little bit of sense of urgency, and essentially, just so you know, what we said to them was, you know, here we are, was, we met with them on Monday and Tuesday, we said, you know, it's like September 12th or whatever. We basically said to them, you know, this process really needs to be done by the middle of November at the latest to be done well, right? Which, which leads me to, um, so I talk a little bit about trends in admissions and what, what we've seen. Uh, we're coming out of COVID and, um, you know, COVID really changed the landscape of college admissions. Uh, and the, the big question is, did it change it forever, or did it change it just kind of temporarily, and when it disappears, it's going to go back to normal? Uh, you know, that's yet to be seen. So let me talk a little bit about some of the changes that, uh, that, that were made, or that we saw. Um, one of the things which was a little bit surprising to me, I, I think it was a little bit blindsided by it, is kids apply to many more colleges uh, than normal. So that has a ripple effect. Well, all of a sudden, you know, kids maybe historically were applying to six or seven colleges, you know, now they're applying to 10, 11, 12 colleges. Um, the ripple effect is this. Colleges kind of, you know, they, they, they go about and they try to predict what their yield is going to be. That's how colleges kind of operate. It's a business. So let, let me, let's use a U of R for example. Let's say the U of R wants a freshman class of 1,000 kids. I'm just making these numbers up. Let's say they want a class of 1,000 kids. So they can kind of go back historically and figure out, okay, to get 1,000 kids to come here, how many acceptance letters should acceptance letters do we need to roll out? And they have all kinds of metrics and data they can figure out from different parts of the country and different majors, who's coming, and all that stuff. Well, when COVID comes along, um, kids are applying to, to more and more colleges, and it made it really, really difficult for colleges to kind of anticipate who was coming or not. So their yield rates were really out of whack, and they just didn't have anything to look at and say, okay, historically, this is how many, this is our yield rate, all of a sudden, we don't know what that's going to look like. So again, here's the domino effect. A lot of kids got put on wait lists. A lot of kids who in the past had the numbers and all the, the criteria to get into certain places didn't get in. 
You had kids who took gap years, and all of a sudden there was that backlog of kids that could apply to college. So it was really, really competitive, and it stayed competitive. Um, a large part of what caused things was colleges going test optional. Okay, so if you think about that, you know, for years and years and years, one of the big metrics that colleges used when making decisions was, was test scores, standardized test scores. You know, we could argue forever about you know, what do they measure, what do they mean, are they valuable, are they not valuable, but they're just that, they're standardized. So you can look at a kid from McQuaid who applies and has a 1400, and you can compare it to a kid from some school in Kansas that applies and has an 1100. We can argue forever about what that means, but the reality is that 1400 is significantly better than this 1100, right? It just is. All right, so now you take that out of the equation, and all of a sudden kids are thinking, okay, you know, maybe in the past I wouldn't have been able to apply to this school because my SAT or ACT scores weren't up to par, but now that's off the table. So kids were applying to more schools than they, than they ever had before. Right? And we're going to talk a little bit more about this whole test optional thing in a minute, but I just want to be sure to kind of set the stage for that a little bit. So we're, we're now we're coming out of it a little bit, but colleges are still test optional. You know, just about all of them are test optional. Right? And we'll talk about what that means in a couple of minutes. So that was one big change. Um, so when you go test optional, <coughs> all of a sudden that's a data point that colleges no, no longer have to look at. Right? Then you throw in the fact that transcripts are hard to compare to begin with, right? I mean, you compare a McQuaid transcript to a Fairport High School transcript to a Pittsburgh Southern transcript, they're all different, right? You know, here, here at McQuaid, we're on a numerical grading system, and we, we weight our grades, our, our APs and advanced classes. Fairport does not. Pittsburgh used to be on, a, on an alpha system. <coughs> so it's very hard to compare transcripts. Then you throw in COVID, a lot of schools go to pass-fail, Right, so how do, you, how do you evaluate that? Regents exams get canceled. There's another measure that's off the table. Some schools are remote learning. Some, you, know, you live in the city, you didn't go to school for almost two years. Some are hybrid. So my point is, now you don't, you don't have test scores, <coughs> excuse me, and you don't have <coughs> really clear transcripts to figure out anymore. Like it's very, very hard to kind of to be in the admissions world right now. It just is, and it's hard for kids to be in it also. All right, so just want to be sure that those are some of the things I think we saw in the uh, you know, post-COVID. Um, one of the good things that we saw is that uh, it was a good time to negotiate financial aid packages. Um, colleges, quite frankly, took a beating for a year and a half. Uh, they lost a whole load of money, and you know, I think right now is probably the best time it's been in the last 30 years to really get in and negotiate good financial aid packages. And so that, that, that's a plus that came out of there. A couple other things we saw. Students fared better in early decision last year. Right? If we were having this meeting 10 years ago, five years ago, I would have been sitting up here and I would have said to you, yeah, early decision, yeah, it's kind of a good idea. You know, if you really fall in love with one school and that school rises to the top, you know, it's, it's, it's a good idea. Be a little bit cautious, but it's a good idea. Now, post-COVID, I would say to you, it's more than a good idea, which is kind of ironic because you know, here these kids have a little bit limited in their ability to search for colleges. But then we're turning around and telling them, you know, if you can find a school that you really love and rises to the top, applying early decision is probably a pretty good idea. And we're going to jump up early decision in a minute. But that's another trend that we saw. Um, students who submitted test scores fared better. Okay? Kids here test optional, they kind of rub their hands and go, hey man, I don't have to take tests. Not true. Okay? Test optional means you have an option to take them, you also have an option not to take them. But you have an option to take them also. And, and honestly, this class really wasn't that affected by uh, their ability to take SATs and ACTs. Test centers were open, they're still open this fall, so they have plenty of opportunity to do that. All right, so kids who submitted their test scores, we'll say it again, they fared much better last year in the admissions world than the kids who did not submit their scores. Um, and then the other thing that's important because, like I said, the, the colleges, they clamor for data. Right? They, that, that's what they need. To make good, informed decisions, they clamor for data. So again, now you, you remove the SATs, transcripts are hard to figure out. So now all of a sudden your senior year grades take on added importance also. So that, that whole thought process of having hey, to take a, you know, a mental vacation my senior year, that, that doesn't happen anymore. You know, and kids can make or break themselves in these next three or four months based on their performance. Because we send mid-year scores to every college. Uh, it's not unusual that the colleges would be calling us in March or April, kind of wanting an update. So like I said, the senior year grades are incredibly important. We've reinforced that with the boys uh, early on this, this year also. 
Um, we'll talk about our college advisory center. If you haven't had an opportunity to see it, we're really proud of this facility. It's right across the hall from the counseling office. Anne Marie runs the facility. Uh, it's a beautiful place. We host all of our college reps there. Uh, it's a great resource uh, facility for, for, for our kids, our seniors, to, to you know, research for scholarships and, and colleges. You know, we started our college rep visits yesterday. So we'll have you know, probably 100 plus colleges visiting here in the next couple of months. So yesterday Notre Dame was here, today Boston College was here, uh, Vanderbilt was here, Dartmouth was here, Pittsburgh was here. So they're starting up in earnest. Uh, tomorrow at the University of Tampa here. So essentially, you know, we reach out. You know, we're very proactive trying to get those colleges to come here because I think our kids <coughs> excuse me, do a really nice job you know, face-to-face -face meeting with these college reps. So you can find a list of, uh, <coughs> I apologize for coughing, I got this crazy cough, I can't get rid of it. Uh, but again, Marie has a list over here of all the colleges that are coming. You can also find it on Naviance. Uh, and like I said, it's a pretty comprehensive list of colleges that are going to be here. <coughs> uh, let me spend a second talking about this college search process. All right, so if you think of it now, so here we are, it's, you know, it's approaching mid-September. <coughs> Some kids are very far along in the process. So I've written three letters this week because they're actually applied, they're, they're pretty much done with certain college. Others are, on the other extreme, have done nothing. <coughs> and, and most of them are somewhere in the middle. But the reality is, no matter where they are right now, they're still okay. They really are. Even if they're way over here and have done nothing, they're still okay. So if, you're, if your son is in that, that side, you're still good. If we're having that conversation a month from now, that's a problem, right? So that was the point that we tried to make with the kids the other day, that it's, it's roll up your sleeves and get their work done, right? So let's talk about what, how, how, how can they search more, right? A lot of searches has already been done, but how can they search? And how can they be good consumers and, and really kind of narrow down their list, right? So some of the things that they should be doing, like I said, we have college reps come here. That's a really good way to start doing your, your search, right? Have conversations with people. You get a real good sense of what their college is all about. Visiting college campuses, there's no, there's no substitute for that. Get, physically getting on campus, meeting with people, you know, seeing the facilities, talking to real humans on those campuses. There, just, there literally is no substitution for that. Um, you know, college fairs. College fairs <coughs> took a break. Yeah, because they're COVID. Now they're coming back. There's virtual fairs online, there's virtual tour. Every college now is up their, their online presence. There's virtual tours and, and virtual information sessions. So there's no shortage of, thing, of ways kids can, can do some searching. Some of the things I think are really important for them to look at right, when, when, they're, when they're looking for, uh, for schools. They have to look at things like acceptance rate. Right? So kid, it, it, it's a little bit shallow statistic, but, it, but it's somewhat important also. So if you're looking at a college's acceptance rate and you say, well, this, this rate is, you know, they're only accepting 8% of the kids, you know, that's telling you something, right? Um, but, but it's not all inclusive, but, it, but it's one, one measure they should be looking at. They also should be looking at retention rate, right? If you're looking at a college and you, you, you look at the stats and you find out that, hey, only like 70% of the kids come back for their, their sophomore year, and that's a problem, right? I mean, if 30% of the kids, for some reason, are not returning for their sophomore year, that should be alarming to you. Right? Why are they leaving? They either didn't like it, they flunked out, so something happened that made them not come back. Right? Um, as a parent, they want a graduation rate, on time graduation rate. You know, if you're looking at a school and they're saying, hey, like 60% of these kids graduate on time, that's a problem. You know, what's happening to the other 40% they're not making it on time? You know, that, that, that's an issue. So I think all those are good metrics to look at when, uh, when you're trying to uh, you know, figure out more, get, get a little bit deeper and figure out more about the school. I would look for yield rates also. Let's think about yield rates. I talked about that a minute ago. So colleges love, they get ranked on their yield rates, they pound their chest about their yield rate, and essentially that means this. They send out their acceptance letters and they don't want to be told no, right? Because they send out 100, 100 acceptance letters and let's say 20 kids out of that 100 take them up on their offer, their yield rate's 20%, right? Which, which honestly is about average. You know, the elite schools, you know, the Ivies and the, uh, you know, the other schools in that category, you know, they're, they're yielding 65, 70%, right? So yield rate is important. So what colleges do, they do kind of a masterful job of trying to figure out how interested are these kids that are applying. And what's the likelihood 
of them coming if they get accepted. Right? So they do everything from their software that, you know, if you don't open their, their emails, they know you haven't opened their emails. You know, if you're called what they call a stealth applicant, they've never heard of you before, and all of a sudden you, your, your application just appears, that's a problem. Right? So, you know, they look closely at your level of interest. That, that's really important. Right? And I think we've talked to the kids about that a lot. Um, some other things I wanted to just talk about before I have Jeff talk about a couple of things here. Um, there's some websites that are that are really good. I think you might want to be aware of. One of them is called Niche. It's N I C H E. It's in that booklet that you have there. Um, that's a great website. It's fun. Kids like it. It's it's nice and narrative in there. Uh, Campus Real is a good good website. Uh, you Visit is another one. All those are in that, that green booklet that, that you have you have in front of you also. Right. Um, just going to talk about you know, the nuts and bolts, the specifics here of how we handle things, right? how, how the actual process works. But before he does that, I mean, I'm going to steal a little bit of his, of his uh, piece here. Let me just talk about you know, how, uh, how admissions decisions are made. Right? We spent a lot of time with the kids talking about how to do the research, how to come up with their list. We talked to them about testing. We talked about all those things. But more importantly, I think, than anything, is that they have to understand, and we all have to understand, you know, how decisions get made on the other side of the table, right? What happens once that college application arrives, right? Because, you know, schools are limited, right? They can't have a lot of really strong candidates get them out in a lot of places, right? That's, that's just the reality. And you, you can drive yourself crazy trying to figure out why did this kid get in and this kid didn't get in. You know, and it's, it's holistic. That's the big catchphrase in the admissions now. So you can look at a kid and say, gee, this kid had a 95 average, this kid had a 92. Why did the 92 kid get it, not the 95? Or this kid had a 1400 SAT, this kid had a 1200. Why did the 1200 get in? Like, it's not that way. They don't just say, let's take, the, let's take the highest grade point average. They're looking at a variety of things. And I think it's really important to understand what those things are, right? So it's your grade point average. But not only is it your grade point average, is what classes did you take to get that grade point average? Right? We have 21 AP classes here at McQuaid. Right? That doesn't mean you have to run out and take 17 of them. But if you're sitting there and you're like a really talented kid, and you've got like a 95 average or whatever, and you've taken no challenging classes here, that's a negative. You know, and it's going to be viewed as a negative. It's going to be viewed as, hey, this is a 95, but it's really kind of a shallow 95. Right? So we talk to kids a lot about the rigor of their curriculum. And we just spent these last two weeks with kids coming into our offices saying, I want to drop this, I want to do this, I don't want to take my fourth year of math, I don't want to do this. And they heard a lot from us saying, you know, you're hurting yourself. You're weakening your, your schedule, your senior year, and it can have negative ramifications in the admission form. Right? So, the, so not only the grade point average, but the rigor of your curriculum. Right? Then you got SAT and ACT scores. Right? Like I said, they're optional. Right? But if you throw down a solid SAT score, or a solid ACT score. It's another thing in your favor in the admissions world. And that's what you're trying to do. You're just trying to stack up things in your side. You know, your grade point average, you, 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 you take an X number of AP classes, you got a strong SAT score. Right? And so, so that's a factor. Uh, your extracurricular activities. Right? So college is the best predictor, they're trying to predict what kids are going to be like when they come to college. Right? And the best predictor of what someone was going to be like in college is what they were like in high school. You know, so if they look at a student and they say, well, this guy was pretty uninvolved in high school, really didn't do a whole lot, wasn't involved in the community at all, they, you know, the only thing they can do is kind of make an assumption that when that kid comes to college, he's probably going to be the same way. And that's not what they're looking for. Right? So, you know, so the activities are important. Kids don't have to have a you know, three-page list of activities. They're just looking for something that the kid's a little bit passionate about, put some time into, and is committed to. Right, so kids stress over that you know, all the time. They're trying to put together this unbelievably lengthy activity resume. That's really not the purpose of it. But they're looking for a few things that they're passionate about that they may continue to do when they get on a college campus. Right? So I would say to kids, look, in this college admissions world, draw a line down the middle. There's your academic story that you're telling. Right? Your academic stories, your transcript, your grade point average, what courses did you take, your test scores, all that good stuff. On the other side is your personal story, your narrative. And quite honestly, you know, like I said, post-COVID, you know, with all the other reasons I mentioned before, now this personal story side, I think, is more is, is, is taking on added importance, which means kids' essays are incredibly important, letters of recommendation are incredibly important, 
interviews, expressing high levels of interest, all that stuff is important. That's your personal story, right? So you, you kind of have to have both, right? Um, so let me talk last thing for a term of interest about this level of interest. I mean, let me go back to the whole yield thing a little bit, like I talked about a minute ago. Colleges don't want to be told no, because if they accept you and you don't come, that it's a negative and it hurts your yield rate. Right? So, so there's this fine line between stalking and showing a high level of interest. Some can stalk, and it's not a good idea either. But showing a high level of interest is, is important. Right? Because push comes to shove, if a college has to make a choice between two kids, you know, they're, they're going to choose in favor of the kid they think is going to come. And how do they know that? Because you know, the kid's visited, he's emailed, he, you know, when they came here, the kid met with him. Right? So showing a high level of interest is, is incredibly important. And, and, you know, a lot of colleges say, yeah, it's not that important. It's important. Okay? Uh, the supreme way of, of showing you know, the, the, the strong level of interest is applying really decision, which I'll, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Right, but all other ways to show interest, get on campus, right? Email, email the admissions office, meet with them when they come here, sign up for a, a Zoom meeting, sign up for a virtual tour. There's multiple ways you can show, uh, you can show interest. But if you don't, you know, even if you're a phenomenal student, you run the risk of not getting in because they don't think you're interested. Right? And, and honestly, like I said, if, you, if, if you're like a stealth applicant, all of a sudden they just see your application, never heard of you before, you know, they're going to think you're really not that interested. Maybe you're just throwing out there as a safety school or as a fallback. But uh, you know, so, so we, kids have heard that from us loud and clear the last couple of weeks about be sure you show a strong level of interest. All right, so Jeff's going to talk to you about the nuts and bolts of how we handle things internally here at McQuay once the, once the boys are actually ready to apply. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Um, it's a pleasure to start to 20 with all of you and your, uh, your students. Um, I really enjoy working with the guys. Um, I always tell people that I feel like I woke up under the right tree and uh, you know, I was able to stick around for this long. So uh, I, love what, I love what I do, I love working with these two, and I'm looking forward to working with all your students. Um, one thing I'd like to, to mention, you know, um, to piggyback on what John was saying about that demonstrated interest piece, I've also told students to demonstrate knowledge. Um, you know, that really does reflect if a student is an informed consumer, which is what, the, what they all become throughout this process. Um, and if they can demonstrate that knowledge through conversations and asking those quote-unquote research-based questions, I think that really fares well for them. Uh, in addition, you know, they can demonstrate their knowledge through if they have to do a supplemental essay, or what we call the Why Us essay. You know, the college says, Why Us? Um, I, and I'm just sharing this because I had a nice conversation with a student today where I, like, things clicked for him. I said, don't think about it like if I'm Cornell, don't think, hey, why us? Think, why us? Like, why this synergy? You know, what, what do you like about us? What did you learn about us? And what are your goals um, as you decide to, you know, if, if, as you see yourself as a student as a part of their community? Um, so I think that's really important in terms of, um, you know, students really feeling confident if they found a good fit college. So. Um, at any rate, I'm going to talk about, like John said, the, uh, the nuts and bolts. I'm the nuts and bolts guy here. Um, so we show the students how to do this process on Monday and Tuesday right here in the auditorium. Um, and I said to them, you know, when you walk out, you're probably going to forget what I showed you, and that's okay. Uh, especially because we have uh, resources available. We've got directions and videos um, right in the, in the Naviance homepage. Plus it's, let's see. Um, so on the Naviance homepage, you can scroll down and find your document resources. Uh, and in the Seniors folder, you're going to find um, a lot of useful information. Uh, we covered this matching Common App and Naviance over our um, mandatory co uh, Common App sessions over the summer. Understandably, many students weren't able to make it, so I'm doing a makeup session for those on Monday. And then Anne Marie is meeting. Uh, with the students who are unable to match their accounts um, and you know sign their, their FERPA agreement. So uh, for those students who missed it, we're going to get them up to speed uh, in the next few days or so. Um, I'm also going to update the senior parent night, so that booklet that you have in hand, it's going to be accessible online, so I'll up update this as well. Uh, but the directions for this process is located right here, uh, transcript and teacher rep requests. So it's written instructions, and there are also links in the instructions for videos, okay? 
Um, so I told the guys, you probably are not gonna watch those, that's okay, come up and see us, we'll help you out. <laughs> but I'm gonna show you folks how this works. So when a student is ready to apply, um, the important thing that everybody needs to know is that there are two submissions to a college. The student really has to worry about, well, two things, but most importantly, he has to make sure that he meets that college deadline, whatever it is, November 1st, November 15th, January 2nd, it doesn't matter. He has to submit his common application or school-specific application by that date. Because if you miss it, it's really, sorry, you're out of luck. Um, so it's really important that the students are mindful uh, of those dates and they work um, and you know efficiently to put their best foot forward in that application when that time comes. All right. So even when that student hits submit on their application, whether it's the day before the deadline, God don't do that. Do it a few days before the deadline. Um, he, this this transcript request. The, the application does not have to be done to do it. Okay, so when a student hits submit, that application is going to be incomplete until Anne Marie sends the transcript, the letters of recommendation, and the school forms. Okay, so when those two things arrive at the college, then you have a complete application. Okay, so to do the transcript request and letter of recommendation requests, what we've asked the students to do is put in the request through Naviance, which I'm going to show you at least 10 school days before that college deadline, okay? So 10 school days, so whenever they're in session, you count that day, don't count weekends, don't count days off for whatever reason, okay? So 10 school days, they need to do this process as well as uh, um, request their letters of recommendation. Now, that application does not have to be done, okay? Like I said, they can wait till the day of that uh, deadline to hit submit, okay? The, on the other hand, a student might be done with the application, you know, well ahead of the deadline, and then might come in and do the transcript request after the fact. And if that's the case, you know, we'll work to get the transcript and rec letters and forms out within 10 school days. Okay. So the bottom line is there are two submissions to a college, the student's common application, and then our stuff, which includes recs, transcripts, and forms. Okay. The, the transcript request has to go out 10 school days before a college deadline and the application does not have to be submitted by that point. And if that um, transcript request is done in well in advance, like 20 days before that college deadline, we'll work within the 10 school days to get the transcript done, okay? So let me show you how to do this. So from the Naviance homepage, all the student has to do is go to colleges, and colleges I'm thinking about. And this is where they've created their list. I used to have tons more in here, but I've done this demo a bunch of times. Um, so this is where a student keeps his list of all the colleges, obviously, that he's thinking about. And it gives us, as counselors, access to see, you know, who they're interested in and, you know, we can just kind of keep in touch when we're not face-to-face. -face. So you can do one transcript request at a time or you can do several. Alright, so I'm going to do a couple. I'll just do the first two here. Check the boxes next to the school name. And then I hit this thing called Move to Applications. Alright. When I click that, I have to answer these questions. What's the deadline that I prefer? Okay, so you have, and we'll t I'll talk about these later, we've got early action, we've got rolling, we have early decision, regular admission, um, and you'll have different like application program de deadline programs at different colleges, and you'll have different deadlines at each college with a lot of overlap, okay? So all you need to do is answer this question, and how you are going to submit your application. All right, so the most, most of the students, if not all, are gonna be using the common application. There are a few colleges that are not members of the common application. And if that's the case, you still have to go through this process, but instead of common app, you would select direct to the institution. Okay, that's a really important question to be answered correctly because it informs Ms. Galetto on how to submit those, um, those documents to the college. So communication is key throughout this entire process. Um, and you can see here, I've already sent my application. If that's the case, you just check the box. Right, so when you get done with that, you hit add and request transcript. I wish we could get rid of this button, but we can't. So avoid add applications. Please click add and request transcripts. So when you do that, it's asking me what kind of transcript I'm requesting. And this initial just means, hey, this is the first transcript that I'm sending in this admissions review process. Okay, that's all that means. So the students check that box, and they just double check to make sure that they've got all their colleges in there correctly. If they want to add any more, they can do that. Uh, and then they hit request and finish. 
Then the colleges are migrated from colleges I'm thinking about to colleges I'm applying to. And then here you can see the deadlines that, that the student has selected, um, you know, what, what application type is, early action priority, et cetera. Then you see the deadline. Um, this is expected difficulty, but, you know, we have those conversations face to face. You know, we talk to students about, hey, you know, this one's going to be a reach for you based on your academic profile, competitive safety schools. Um, those are good conversations to have. And we have the data. If you guys have been playing around with Naviance, you've seen the scattergrams that we have. Um, and we use those to predict. Okay? Um, and this shows if the transcript has been requested. And this section right here, um, which, sorry, I can see it better. Office materials is pending right here. This just refers to whether or not we sent the materials to the college at RS. So when those the transcripts and docs get sent, um, this will change to initial materials submitted. Okay, so it's a good thing to keep track. I had a student come in and um, he emailed me twice today asking about the progress of his application, and then he saw me in person. He's like, "I'm really sorry to hassle you." I'm like, "You're not hassling me. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. You're following through. You're being responsible." So we do want the students to follow up with us. Um, and let us know if they have questions about the, you know, how this process is going at our end. Um, and then you see the submission type. So all of these just mean, so the CA stands for Common Application. Um, and then you have these TV screens, or computer screens rather, which just refers to that we can send things online. Okay? For a, a direct to the institution application, you'll see this screen here um, without the CA inside. Or you'll see a postage stamp if we have to you know, send it in the mail. Okay. Um, and then this just the student can update this list if they want to as to whether or not they've applied. Okay. So once the student does that transcript request, they then have to go in and request their recommendation letters. All right. And again, that, this has to, to be done 10 school days before that college deadline to allow the teachers enough time to write the recommendation letters. We have some teachers who are getting bombarded with requests. That's just the nature of the game. So we want to make sure that we give them enough time and respect them, uh, their professionalism. So <clears throat> to do the recommendation request, there's a couple ways to do that. You can scroll to the bottom of this list, and you can see this link right here. The other way to do it is to go up and go to colleges, and underneath the Apply to College section, you hit Letters of Recommendation. And when we get here, this lists the schools um, that I have uh, transcript requests for. And all I have to do is hit Add Request. Oh, sorry, that's not true. These are the schools. Uh, these show the recommenders that have already requested. Okay, so in our, in our demonstrations, I chose Ms. Galetto to write my recommendation letter. So this shows what I have in progress already. Um, so for new requests, I just hit Add Request, and then I think about who that teacher is that's going to write my recommendation letter. Okay, and then what I do is I'm just assigning Mr. DePippo's letter in this example to all the colleges that I want that letter to go to. But I have to pay attention to these requirements here. Okay? This shows that Adelphi, they don't require any teacher recommendations letters, but they'll take up to four. Am I going to send them four? No. Okay? Probably I'm going to ask for about two solid recommenders, you know, maybe from core courses preferably, but if that's not, you know, that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, there might be a teacher who knows the student much better than one of their core uh, class teachers, and that's okay. Similarly, um, we have some recommenders who um, work you know, outside of school with students as like a mentor or a, a, a coach or an employer. Um, those recommenders will go through the common application. Okay? And I show the students how to do that as well. Okay? Um, but I'm not going to show you that right now. It's just a different process. It's only for a handful of students, but we, we've walked several students through that process. So this recommendation process for, uh, through Naviance is only for teachers. Okay? We only want teacher recs going through here because if we send a coach's recommendation through here, um, then that might take the place of a teacher recommendation and we just don't want that to happen. Okay? So the students really need to pay attention to these requirements, how many are allowed, and then how many they requested for each of those colleges. Okay? So if I scroll down here, I can see some things that are in red. So the University of Alabama, I won't be able to send any recommendation letters to them. They just don't allow it. Then Dayton, I've already requested the maximum allowed, so I can't do any more um, requests for that particular college. Okay? So again, this is really important data uh, for the guys to pay attention to. If you hit select all, obviously you're assigning that recommender to every single one of those colleges that will allow it to go. Okay? So I kind of I'm like I try to push students away from doing that because if they just do that, it's less 
there's less mindfulness, I guess, is a way to put it. So we want them to pay attention to where they are um, um, strategically sending their recommendation letters. Okay. So when you do that, when you sign, when you sign the teacher, you go down to the bottom, and then you can write, you know, a quick blurb as to why you were um, asking them for the recommendation letters. Um, but I also created for the students uh, teacher brag sheets, you know, similar to what your parents and uh, students got this summer, the senior brag sheets and the parent brag sheets. Those are for us counselors because, you know, we have to write a letter that encompasses, you know, that student's um, kind of full experience here at McQuay. The teacher recommendation letter should encapsulate that student's academic performance throughout the year. Um, how they like face challenges in classes, um, how they deal with setbacks maybe, how they contribute to class discussion. So it's really centered around that classroom experience. So we made some brag sheets um, where students can remind teachers of you know, why I'm asking you, what I really enjoyed about your class. If you're going to call me a hard worker, this is an example of my hard work. So it's those details that are really important that will beef up a letter of recommendation. Because if I say hard work, that can apply to anyone. But if I'm talking about how, how I chunk my assignments every night just so I can keep up, that's, that's unique to me. So we want the students to give that kind of information to teachers. And as a person who writes a lot of recommendation letters, the more information we have, the easier the process is for us, the, the easier, the better the process is for the students. Uh, in, in the admissions process as well. So the recommendation letters and the brag sheets are extremely important. Okay, Okay. so when we get done with that, when you just say a quick thank you, um, if I can spell, then I would hit submit request. I'm not going to do that because I don't want uh, Mr. DePippo to get some strange request from a student that doesn't exist named Kent Dorfman that he reads about. Um, so at any rate, that's how you do the transcript request. That's how you do the letter of recommendation requests. Okay. Um, I want to talk about college deadlines. Um, you saw on that one, on the, on the transcript request, where um, I was asked to choose which deadline that I'm going to be working with. Um, you know, the first one, I think they're on page 19 in your book here. Yeah, so early decision starts off with that. So colleges can have, or will have, multiple deadlines and, you know, um, probably multiple admissions plans. They'll probably have early decision. Uh, they might have early decision two. They might have early action and or early action two in addition to a regular decision. So it's important to know what these colleges have for deadlines, all right? So early decision, many of you have heard about this. It's essentially a binding agreement where I as an applicant say, hey, if you accept me, I'm gonna go to your school, all right? And that means if I'm saying that, I'm not able to apply to any other early decision, early decision colleges out there. Um, only one early decision school. I can still apply early action to other schools. I can still apply regular decision to other schools. But if I get into that early action, I'm sorry, if I get into that early decision college, that means I have to withdraw my other applications that might be in play already. Because I signed an agreement saying I'm gonna, I'm gonna attend your school if you accept me, okay? Um, you heard from Mr. Serafine already. That's you know that's like a um, you know the ultimate form of demonstrated interest. And colleges know it's a one for one except it's 100 percent yielding essentially, unless there's some kind of financial hardship that they, the uh, the family sees as a result of their financial aid package. So that being said, um, you know our advice to students is like use early decision if you are fully confident that you want to go to this college. If you fall in love with it, if it's a good fit academically, socially. Um, financially as well, and there are tools to help you figure that out. You have a net price calculator on, on every school's website, so you can plug in your tax information uh, and you can get an estimated financial aid package. Uh, so you can kind of get a sense of what that financial aid package would be to really make an informed decision about um, going early decision or not. Okay. Um, early action. Uh, oh, what I didn't tell you about early decision, it's not only an early deadline, it's also you get early notification from that college. So students, if you apply by like November 1st, you'll find out in December whether or not you get into that college. Okay? And that's the same, same way as early action. Uh, you apply early, you find out earlier, but you don't have to commit. And you can apply to several early action colleges at one time. So you can get all your applications done early, you can get all your acceptances in, you can focus on your grades, you can start thinking about where do I really want to attend, you can compare and contrast and negotiate financial aid packages, 
you have all that time to make the decision after you receive that decision from the college. Um, and so what you'll have to do at some point, um, well, by May 1st, is decide on the, the, um, the college that you want to attend, okay? Um, regular decision is essentially, like, you can apply to as many colleges under the regular decision plan. Um, it's usually a later deadline, um, you know, I want to say January, sometimes even February. It really is December for some colleges. Um, and so, so basically, a regular decision application might be, so for, for me, if I'm an applicant, you know, and I've shown an upward tre trend from, you know, freshman through junior year, and I'm still not ready to, to apply because I want to give my first quarter, maybe my first semester grades a chance to show that continued trend. Um, maybe I want to spend some extra time on my essay, because ideally I want to set my best foot forward at the appropriate time. So I don't want to rush an application just to get it done by early action. Um, I have to consider, you know, um, my own circumstances to decide on whether or not I should be going early or regular. It's okay to go regular, um, but we would want to have conversations with those students about, I mean, we plan, we will have those conversations with students about, you know, when they're going to apply, so we can help them kind of strategize those things. Um, there's also something called restrictive early action, which in a sense is very similar to regular decision. I was listening to Notre Dame yesterday talk about them being uh, restrictive early action. And in my mind, it's like, well, why don't you just go early decision? Um, because essentially, I think if I have it correctly with them, because there's going to be nuances that are different from college to college that have these restrictive early action deadlines. So if you're applying for restrictive early action to Notre Dame, they don't want you to apply like early decision anywhere else. So when I heard that, it's, they treat it as if it were like um, you know an early decision. But you can apply early action to other colleges. Okay. So if you were looking at a school with restrictive early action, it's a, it's really important to understand what the policies are surrounding that. And all your admissions websites on the colleges so, um, uh, websites will tell you what that's about. Tell you about those policies. Um, and then you have rolling admission. So rolling admission is basically how McQuaid works. Um, as batches of applications come in, uh, colleges will um, review them and kind of give out their decisions as the years on a rolling basis. Um, and our advice to students for rolling um, that deadlines is to try to get in a little bit sooner than later, uh, maybe a lot of it sooner than later, because if you think about it, if they, if they give out these acceptances as the year goes on, one can assume that they'll be that it will get more competitive as the school year goes on, okay? Um, so if a student is competitive, maybe even a little bit of a reach applicant at a rolling school, you know, I'd say, let's try to get that stuff in a little bit earlier so that you can have a greater chance for admission, okay? Um, and then you'll get decisions from colleges. So, you know, under the early decision uh, plan, you know, a college can, they can deny a student outright. Um, they can defer that student into the regular applicant pool, giving them a second uh, review. So if that happens, if I apply early decision by November 1st, and they say, we're going to defer you to the regular applicant pool, what that means is I'm off the hook for that early decision agreement, and I can maybe have an early decision two at like my second top choice school. Um, but then I still know that my application is in play at that original early decision school, so I can update that admissions office with any scores or grades or accolades for that matter. Okay. Uh, similarly, with early action, you get deferred into the regular applicant pool, you can get denied outright, and obviously you can be accepted in that plan, okay? Um, and, you know, with regular decision, because of those deadlines being a little bit later, the, the colleges have to notify students of their admissions decisions by April 1st, okay? Because that gives families a month before the enrollment deposit deadline, which is May 1st, figure out what's going to be the best fit uh, for the student and the family. Okay. Um, and then there are wait lists. So wait lists are essentially like, you know, if, if colleges aren't sure about a student, um, you know, but they want to kind of keep them in their back pocket because they're trying to shape their class and they're not sure what their what their melt is going to be, which basically means how many students say they're going to be coming, but then they don't end up coming. Um, the colleges will go to the wait list. Uh, for those students who are kind of, it's like a little purgatory or being in limbo for that matter. Um, so the colleges will take a look at their wait list if they need to add any students to their class in any particular area. So the wait lists aren't necessarily like, you know, in order by a waiting list or by order of GPA. 
they'll pick off students from that waiting list depending upon how they're trying to shape their class. You know, if they're trying to grow their, you know, their engineering department or shrink their English department, whatever it might be. Um, so that's how they'll, they'll take students off the waiting list. And that can happen, you know, into the summer, uh, sometimes as late as July. You know, so like a lot of students end up on the waiting list. It's probably going to happen to a lot of your students out there. Um, but what's important is that the student is on the wait list, that they do put in their enrollment deposit at a college where they feel is going to be a good fit for them, so they do have a place to go. And if they make it off that wait list at their, their number one college, you guys can have that discussion um, if that college comes through for them. Okay? So I think that's all I got. I'm going to turn it back over to uh, John. Let me add just one thing about the uh, early decision. Colleges love early decision. Yeah. I mean, because really what happens is it takes the guessing out, right? And, and the kid is coming along. They yield, like Jeff said, they yield 100% of those kids. So if they can fill their class, or like 50% of their class with really decision candidates, they love that, right? So then you go back to early action. They're like early action, too, because what they find is that the kids that apply early action tend to be more serious about coming to that school than kids that apply regular decision. So if you look at that model, you say, okay, regular decision, maybe they yield 20% of those kids. Early action, they might yield like 40% of those kids. And then you know, early decision, they're yielding, they're yielding all of them. Right? So like I said, early decision is a, is a big plus for colleges. It's become a, kind of a controversial thing with schools gobbling up 50, 60% of their class. Right? Um, so I want to add to the waiting list also. One of the things we saw post-COVID was that just that more and more kids were getting put on the wait list. Right? Let me use an example I used earlier about the U of R. Let's say the U of R wants a wants to uh, enroll a class of 1,000 incoming freshmen. They'll, they know historically to get 1,000, maybe they have to send out 4,000 acceptance letters. You know, that, that's historically. You send out 4,000 letters, we get 1,000, or yields 25%, whatever. But what happens if they send out 4,000 letters and they get like 800? Right, that's a problem. Right, the admission bill. It's big money, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. That's why they have wait lists. The wait list is like their security blanket. Right? They'll send out 4,000 acceptance letters. They may send out another 1,000 letters saying, hey, you're on our wait list. So if they don't get the number that they want, then they reach out to that wait list. You know, it can happen on May 1. It can happen in August. Right? But it, it would be highly likely that most kids here will get, a, will get placed on a wait list someplace. Right? Then there's all kinds of strategies about what to do if you're on the wait list. You know, a lot of kids got a wait list to say, I forget about it. They just drop off. You, know, you have to continue to express interest. <laughs> you can send updated transcripts and maybe an additional letter of recommendation. You, you have to be persi persistent. That's where you, you, you work to get off that wait list. Can I add something to that? Sure. Yeah, so if, when students, if they do get put on the wait list, a lot of times the colleges will notify them in the email. Um, they'll give like a, a link um, to go to this page and their website and login credentials. And what they can do is they can upload any documents or up updates that way. But it's really important to follow the directions from the college. They'll tell you what they want and what they don't want. So that's one thing I've realized is important, just to follow those directives. Right, I'm just going to spend a couple minutes talking about financial aid. Uh, we, we can make a whole evening on financial aid. Naturally, on September 28th, right here, we, we, are, we have our financial aid night. Samantha Veter, who's the director of financial aid at the University of Rochester, she'll actually be here that night with us. So if you want to mark that out of your calendar, actually, I think we sent an email out today to everyone to, 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 to uh, to mention it. So September 28th, 6.30, right here. But let me just give you a couple little bits and pieces about financial aid. First of all, it's a pretty unforgiving system if you miss deadlines. Okay? And the first deadline is October 1. Right? You really can't do a whole lot. You can't submit your FAFSA. You really can't do anything until October 1. But in reality, you should do. You should get out of the financial aid train as soon after October 1 as possible. Right? The major player in the financial world, in financial aid world, is a form called the FAFSA. Right? It stands for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Right? Now, it is, it's essentially like in like an elongated income tax form, right? You're going to go out you're, you're, you're going to ask all kinds of information about your family, financial situation, from your income to your assets, to how many kids are in college, and on and on and on. But the, the common mistake that people make is they listen to other people. You know, your neighbors, your friends, your relatives, and you say, well, I did that, I didn't get any money, so therefore I'm not going to get any money. Either. That's a really dangerous thing to do. Everyone's financial situations are different. Uh, if you don't do the FAFSA, you're, you're ruling yourself out automatically with a lot of, lot of financial aid. Right? So I really would encourage you to do the FAFSA. And again, you can't do that until after October 1. Right? So that's a big player. 
There's also another full form that's called the CSS profile. All right, so a lot of private colleges, in addition to the, the FAFSA, will ask you to do the CSS profile. So the profile is basically like the, uh, the FAFSA on steroids. They just ask you more questions, dig a little bit deeper. All right, so good rule of thumb on that. It's usually private schools, and quite honestly, the more selective schools tend to want you to, want the, you to complete the CSS profile also. Okay. Um, if, you look, if you think of it this way, I mean, if you were to look in this area alone, you say, let, let's go school shopping in Rochester, and let's look at some sticker prices, right? You know, the sticker price that's hanging from the U of R is about $80,000, right? The sticker price that's hanging from Nazareth and Fisher is about $53,000, $54,000. The sticker price that's hanging from Geneseo, Brockport, and even SUNY schools is around twenty-five. dollars right? So you can look at it that way, and, and you can be really kind of, you know, not have a really good picture of things. And people get intimidated, rightly so, because of the sticker price. But you have to let, if you let the system play itself out, do the FAFSA, you know, follow the instructions that they give you. A lot of times, I mean, not many people are paying eighty thousand dollars to go to the U of R. They're just not. Not many people, if any, are playing fifty-five thousand dollars to go to Nazareth or Fisher. You know, you know, most of them are playing about half of that. So my point is, you have to let that system play itself out. Right? And the way you do that is initially is you should complete the FAFSA. The major number that you want to be concerned with is what's called your expected family contribution, right? And you can go online and you can, there's all kinds of, they're called EFC estimators, there's all kinds of things you can do. There's websites in that new book that we gave you that, that help you do that also. But, but I, as a parent, I want to know, I want to know what, what might my expected family contribution be, right? Let me, let me tell you how that works. So let's say we apply to the U of R, it's $80,000 to go, but that's the cost of attendance. I submit my FAFSA online, and it comes back and it says, okay, Seraphine family, your expected family contribution is $20,000. All right, so they're basically crunching all these numbers, you know, and they're saying, okay, this is what we think you, your family should be able to contribute to your child's education. So now there's a $60,000 gap there, right, between the cost of attendance and my expected family contribution. And that's where the negotiating step needs to happen. All right, so, so a place like U of R is going to put together a financial aid package for you. It's going to have three components. It's going to have scholarships and grants, which is free money, you're not paying that back. It's going to have loans, which are evil, and you're going to have work study, right, where you, you, your son gets a job on campus and makes a little bit of a, you know, kicking around them. Right? But what happens a lot is, and I say people all the time, I think people don't negotiate enough. And, and I think right now is a really good time to negotiate. So I think if you get a financial aid package, it's always wise to appeal that package. Now, you, you may not get an additional $20,000, but you may get, a, may get two or $3,000. You know, and the more, the more uh, attractive and marketable your, your child is, or how, you know, how attractive he is in the admissions process, you know, you become even, even, even more negotiable. Right? So, and you also, if you think of financial aid, there's two types of financial aid. There's need-based and there's merit-based. Right? And most financial aid is need-based. And that's determined from the FAFSA. Right? Now, if you look at like the top 40, 50 colleges <coughs> in the country, they don't give merit aid because they don't need to. The schools just below those, they give merit aid so they compete so they can compete with those schools that are that upper echelon schools. Okay? So there are a lot of really good deals to be had right now, just below those top 40, 50 schools in the country. There really are. Okay? So again, I don't want to get into you know financially too deep, but I just want to give you a little bit of information about that. Um, at every single college website that gets federal monies, that's all the way except like Grove City, they all have a net price calculator. Some are more elaborate than others, but the purpose of a net price calculator is you should be able to go on, answer some basic questions about your family finances, and get a pretty good estimate as to what your expected family contribution is going to be. All right, like I said, you can just Google that and find out what EFC calculators or estimates. And I would encourage you to do that. <coughs> right, let me shift gears and just talk for a little bit more about standardized testing. Okay. Again, we're in this weird phase of test option. Right? So kids think, I'm not going to take it, it's optional. Right? And like I said earlier, if you don't take it, I think it's a little bit of a negative. Here's the beauty of, of test optional now. I, I think the optional part is the, the strategic part. Take the test. Take it a couple times. You know, get your best score. Then you have to be strategic about whether you not whether or not you submit your score. All right? Let me, let's use the U of R again for an example. If I were to go online and Google, 
Okay, what's the mid 50th percentile of SAT scores at the U of R? Which means, okay, 50% of the kids that they accept are going to fall and have an SAT score that ranges from 1340 to 1500. Okay, that's true. So they're saying, okay, 25% of the kids they accept have an SAT score higher than 1500. 25% of the kids they accept have an SAT score lower than 1340. All right, let's say you take the SAT score, the SATs and your high scores are 1200. You'd be crazy to submit your SAT score to U of R. Right? They're telling you this is this is their 25th percentile and their 75th percentile. If you don't fall within that range and their test option, they're giving you an L. Don't don't submit. Right? On the other hand, let's say you get a 1380, you'd be crazy not to submit. Right? So to me, the optional part is some schools make a ton of sense to submit your SAT scores to, based on their mid 50th percentile. Some makes no sense to. If you don't fall in that mid 50th percentile, don't submit them. I mean, colleges, they mean it when they say they're test optional. They, they are they're truly optional, it's not going to hurt them. But again, if you can submit a score you know, that falls within that range, it's just another plus in your, in your, in your, in your side. You know, I was talking with a lady from Cornell this summer in the admissions office, and she said, yeah, she was, it's, she was, the tests are optional, she said, a lot of things are optional, like uh, taking AP, uh, the AP course, that's optional. You know, being, being a good kid, that's optional. Uh, showing interest, that's optional. Getting a 90 grade point, all those things are optional. But if you don't have them, you know, the, fewer, the, the fewer that you have, it, it's a problem, right? right? So I just want to be sure we understood that. Um, super scoring. Right, so let's say kids take the test two, three times, as many of them do. You know, most colleges super score, or power score, they call it that. So what they're doing is they're taking your highest math score from one test date and hooking up with your highest reading and writing from a different test date. That's super score. That's why it behooves kids to take the test two or three times. Right? Um, there are, kids still have an opportunity to test this fall. Actually, there's a, there's a test this weekend. Um, there's an ACT in October. You, they can still test in November. And I, and I do think it's a wise idea to do that. You know, and another thing that you oftentimes you don't hear, which I think is dangerous about the test optional thing, is a lot of times you look at that as for admissions purposes. You know, kids will look at it and say, hey, look, you know, I, I've got a 1200. I, I, everything I look at tells me that that's, good, that's more than okay for the school I'm looking at, for admissions sake, which it might be. But what you might not know is that internally, they have some, you know, some merit aid money that they dole out based on SAT scores. You know, they may have something where internally they say, okay, for kids that have a 90 average and above, and they get a 1250 SAT score, or the top 10% of their class, whatever, we're going to give them right away, we're going to discount them $10,000 right away. Right, you may be sitting there with your 1230, going, I'm fine to get in. But if you take it in again and get 20 more points, you may have even won yourself like 10 grand. Right, so I, that's why I think it's a good idea to take the test multiple times. And I think it's a good idea to be strategic about where you choose to submit your scores. To me, that's the beauty of what, what test option is now. Okay. Uh, last thing I'm going to talk about, then we'll get you out of here, I promise, is, uh, uh, which is kind of the, the uh, <laughs> dreadful part for most seniors right now, is the essay, right, the college essay. Um, it's stressful. It's hard to write about yourself. It just is. And kids have a hard time. If you try to write the perfect essay, you know, they'll say, I've never had nothing horrible happen to me. So like, who said you had something horrible happen to you to write a good essay, right? Or, geez, I've never had anything spectacular happen to me. You know, you're spectacular. There's only one you write about, it, right? So we spend a lot of time talking to kids about their essays. I, I think they're incredibly, incredibly important. I think you have to know what types of essays they're going to write. You know, so everyone is going to write one that's called a personal statement. I don't like the word essay because it's really not an essay. It's a personal statement. That's part of the common application. Right? Everyone's going to write that. <clears throat> it's a maximum of 650 words. It's not a long thing. And quite frankly, I think the best ones I've read are a lot less than 650 words. Right? But everyone's going to write that. Then, depending on what schools you apply to, some schools have what are called supplemental essays. Jeff talked about it a little bit. Some schools have one or two. Some have none, MIT is nine, all right? So you could very well, like if you're applying to eight schools, you could end up writing like 16, 17, 18 essays, right? So and we don't want, I don't want kids to get, you know, all of a sudden they, they don't realize that until they get deep into this. Thing. I, mean, I didn't realize Boston College had two other essays besides the Common App essay. And oh, I'm applying to Cornell, they happen to have two more also. I mean, all of a sudden that, that grows quickly. Right? So that's just something to be mindful of when we talk to the kids about. Un understand, you know, find out what schools you're looking at, if they have supplemental essays or not. And that's all that stuff is right out of the, uh, the common application. Right? A couple last things about essays. When I tell kids, 
you know, write about something that's meaningful to you and something that shows personal growth. All right, meaningful and it shows personal growth. And I tell kids this, I, say, I, have, a, I have what I call a three sentence rule. <coughs> and I say, write your first three sentences, hit the brakes, and then ask yourself this question. Could any other human being write this essay? And if the answer is yes, I tell them to crumble it up and throw it out and start over again. Right? Let me give you an example. Someone says, my, uh, my mother has had, had a significant influence on my life. That's the opening sentence. That's, that's great. It's beautiful. But you know what? A lot of kids' mothers have had significant influences on their life, right? That's not, that doesn't really make me want to read a whole lot. I know where that's going, right? Or, or I, uh, you know, I, I tore my ACL. And like, okay, I know where this is going, too, right? Yeah, I went to rehab, I recovered, and I, I made the team. And so, so my point is, try to write something that's a little bit different, right? And honestly, you know, kids are looking for this big topic to write about. You know, the, the, the tragic event or the magnificent event. And quite honestly, the best essays to me are where kids pick a little bit of their life and they write about it and they blow it up. You know, I always tell kids, let's, let's look at your essay. Find a sentence that I think is really meaningful and let's blow that sentence up and write about it. Um, so let me go back to that example. I always do this. Uh, so, you know, my mom passed away a few years ago, but she used to ride a bike eat every morning at like 5 o'clock in you know, the hills of Geneva. So I'd say to the kids, if I write an essay about my mom, and I say, um, you know, you can find my, mom, my 89 year old mother riding her yellow Schwinn bike with a uh, red flower on her, hanging out of the basket up and down the hills of Geneva uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning. I'd say, can anybody else say that? No. That's a whole different essay than saying my mom's had an influence in my life. All right? That's a goofy example, but my point is, you, you've got to be unique. And what happens is you have to know your audience, right? You write these essays, people are reading thousands of these things, right? And they're boring. And you lose that. Right? I mean, you just, seriously, you, you lose that. If, you're, if you don't catch them early, you're done. You know, I had two of my own kids worked at a college for Michigan, but one still does. And I watched her, and she's like, I've read this essay eight million times. It's the same essay. Just written by a different kid. Right, so you have to grab them early. And the way you do early is you know those first two or three sets, you've got to be a little bit unique. So those are the types of things they've heard from us. Okay? Uh, and again, I, I think the essay is an unbelievably important piece of the application process. It's where you become human, it's where you kind of reach out and say, let me tell you who I am on paper. Because right? other than that, you know, you're looking at numbers and you know, SAT scores and all that. Yesterday I thought it was pretty interesting. Someone asked, oh, Notre Dame and Boston College they asked the guy, he said, how long do you uh, spend on an application? And he said, yeah, 10 minutes. You know, so you think about it. So these kids spend 17 years doing, you know, a million things, right? <coughs> they're taking classes, they're volunteering, they're playing sports, they're doing all this stuff. You know, the high school kids need a union more than anybody. But they're doing a million things. And then they put this stuff down and someone who has no clue who they are spends about 10 minutes and goes, yeah, you're in or you're out. It's a pretty harsh Reality, right? <coughs> yeah, um, about the essays, uh, where I show you in the document resources section of Naviance, if you open up that document resources folder, there is a whole section called essays in there. We have an example essay, we've got some videos, exercises, whatever, to help students uh, get the juices flowing. <coughs> and it, you know, I love helping students with essays, so that's you know, probably some of the best parts of the job because I really get to learn about the students and help them kind of figure out you know what this you know what the story actually means to them so it's 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 daunting but it's a lot of fun too it can be formative but I told all my students to tell you why me to read his essay so I read it and I said let me give you some really honest feedback he said, I said you're not very likable so <laughs> you get into his essay you know, he, just, he just talks about how wonderful he is I said listen I said if you walked into my office and I've never met you before in my life and you walked in and I started telling you how great I am what would you do you can't go he says in jerk I said that's not what you want to do in this he said, I did this, then I did this, then I did more of this, then I scored 72 goals, then I did this, then I said, it's like, stop. It's like, you know, it's not, it's not being likable, it just isn't. You know, I said, be vulnerable. It's okay to be vulnerable. It, it really is. It's, that's, that's part of it. That's, that's being likable. You know, talk about what you're afraid of or what you don't know or where you failed or, you know, just be vulnerable. It's, it's a little bit more appealing than just tell them how fantastic you are. Hopefully, it wasn't any of your sons, but I didn't do it to me. I just said, you know, it's not very likely. Um, and here's the other thing I would tell you is this the last thing we'll get you out here. Um, 
parents, and I was guilty of it too, you, 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 want, you want to see your kids' essays, you want to be sure it's right, and then you want to show it to your friend, and you want to show it to this one, and you want to show it to their English teacher, and you want to show it to 22 other people. All of a sudden, the essay's done, it sounds nothing like that. Right? So I, I'd be very cautious. Everyone's going to have an opinion. If, you give me, if some kid gives me his essay, I read it, gives it to Jeff, gives it to anybody, everyone's going to have an opinion on it. And quite honestly, it's their voice, and it has to be their voice. I've read essays that I know they're written by parents. I've read essays that have been written by outside people. They're pretty easy to tell like that, right? The difference between a 17-year-old boy's essay and a 50-year-old boy's is totally different and very easy to, to figure out, right? So, you know, let them roll. You know, when, I, when I'm working at kids' essays, I'm, I'm, I'm doing some grammatical stuff with them. I'm, you know, I'm going to help them start, you know, with, with a more catchy start or stronger finish. But I'm not going to, you know, totally revamp it or redo it for them. Because like I said, then he loses, uh, loses his voice. That's not a good idea. Right? Uh, last thing I would say to you was the first thing I said to you tonight. We, we've done this a long time. Our job is to help your sons and you have some success through this process. Um, we've had a couple of really, really good years here in situations that were really tough through COVID. Um, I think we can compare our results to just about anybody. And we're, we're, you know, the types of schools our kids are going to, our acceptance rates and all that stuff. But it's a lot of hard work. And, 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 Lean on us, you know, come in and talk to us, meet with us, call us, email us. It's, it's, a, it's a group thing. Uh, but the last thing I want to have happen is you or your, your son feel a little bit like uneducated on this process because it goes by like this. And that's what we told the boys the other day. We said, look, it, 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 November's going to be here like that, right? I mean, the fall of your senior is, is unbelievably quick. You know, kids are playing sports and they're, you know, plays and working. It just, it just disappears in a hurry. And essentially, Doing this well, this college piece, is like taking another course for like the first half of the year. It really is. Uh, there's just a lot, of, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done. Right? So again, please, please reach out to us, come on in and, and, and communicate with us any way we can. Right? Uh, we'll stick around. If you have any questions you want to ask us, please feel free to come up. I, I really appreciate you coming out tonight and for trusting us with your guys. Thanks. Thanks.